My guest today is a dear colleague of mine sitting with me at the Microsoft Senior Leadership Team. Is someone we think deeply about how technology will affect people, communities, and society overall. He's Executive Vice President and CTO of Microsoft, Kevin Scott. Kevin plays a key role in shaping Microsoft AI strategy. He's deeply, deeply passionate about creating technology that benefits everyone. It's his job, actually, to ask where we need to fill the gaps or build something that does not exist yet. Kevin grew up in the rural town of Gladys, Virginia, a place that's been and will continue to be changed by emerging technologies. And I know from working closely with him for the last couple of years and talking to him over the years that he thinks deeply about the potential impact of AI on the people and workplaces in towns like Gladys and many others. So he's also the host of the brilliant Behind the Tech podcast, which uh, invites listeners to gig out with an amazing lineup of tech heroes, inventors, innovators. He's also the author of a great book, Reprogramming the American Dream, uh, which I highly recommend, by the way. So Kevin, a very warm welcome to the Positive Leadership Podcast. Oh, thank you for having me and for the uh, very kind and generous introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, one of the big themes running through your book uh, that I was mentioning is the power of storytelling. You know, it's foundational to our existence, and that's something that I like to pick up in our conversations going on. In a Positive Leadership Podcast, one of the first things that we get people to do, actually, is to write down or share the story of their life, a little bit at least, <laughs> to reflect on the moments that have shaped them into the person and leader that they are today. So I'd like to start at the very beginning of your story back in Gladys, Virginia. What was it like for you as a kid growing up? Who or what was the largest influence on you and your core beliefs, Kevin? Yeah, so the biggest influence on my beliefs, and maybe, you know, maybe the better way to say it is just sort of my, uh, you know, ethos and values were right. my, my, my family. Um, yeah. and so we were, uh, you know, we, we certainly weren't well off. Like we were, uh, you know, at, at times like, you know, had a lot of financial difficulty and at best, uh, you know, my, my family was always uh, paycheck to paycheck, but, mm. you know, I, I don't think we really paid much a attention to that or at least that's hmm. not the you know the thing that yep. we were always talking about my dad was a construction worker and my mom uh you know hustled with a b bunch of little side jobs that she did she was a tax preparer hmm. she uh you know ran a nursery school uh for <laughs> the kids at church uh uh for a, a brief period um yeah you know, she she did a whole bunch of work but like her primary job was uh taking care of the family and you know i i just had the luxury of being around a bunch of people who were mm. uh hard working very curious who always worked with their hands who were always tinkering with something and who uh felt like they had an obligation to their community to mm. do something valuable uh yeah. like you know that, that our job was to take care of each other people who care for their community right and uh, yeah who are serving others uh, in their day to day lives as well, all the yeah. time. <laughs> so something that's important to you, I think Kevin is also referenced in the title of your book is the American dream. This idea that anyone, regardless of where they were born and what class they were born into, can attain their own version of success. And it's an idea that has served as a powerful motivation for many people in the US for many years and around the world as well, <laughs> inspiring people to strive again for a better life. In your book, you paint a vivid picture, again, of your parents, and you just discuss some of that. So uh, I'd like to understand, did the American dream seem like something that was within their grasp or yours as their child, in a way? I, I it's, so I, I think I've thought a lot about this, this idea of the American dream over the uh, mm. past handful of years, and I, I think one of the things that a lot of people may uh may be getting confused about is like confusing the idea of a dream and a promise um uh, uh -huh. and the the thing that both my parents and i uh believed when i was growing up and you know i still believe this and and you know my family back in virginia still believes this is that there is this motivating idea that like if you go 
figure out some way to be valuable to your fellow human beings uh, uh-huh. that you you know you try to understand what they want and need and then you go do work and work as hard as you possibly can to try to meet those uh, needs, needs of your fellow human beings that uh, good things will happen to you and and it doesn't mean that you know like you uh, yeah I, t- I tell this to my kids all the time like CTO of Microsoft or, you know, yep. you know head of global business for Microsoft mm-hmm. or, or, you know, whatever these big yeah. titles are. Mm-hmm. Like, there's so much luck involved in that. Like, that's a crazy thing to try to fixate on and plan for. But yep. I would have been okay no matter what my outcome was mm-hmm. uh, by just applying this, you know, mm-hmm. set of ideas that, you know, like I can work hard, try to discover, you know, what's valuable to do and then going to – do that thing um Hmm. and it it is it really isn't a promise and like it was kind of implicit uh in in the way that my parents talked to me about this and in how they acted it's like you you Mm -hmm. just have to go do the work and like you got to go grind through it and (laughs) you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and it's just it's maybe even more valuable to do something and fail and learn something from the uh-huh. failure and then get up and go again uh, as it is succeeding. Like sometimes success teaches you nothing. Yeah, absolutely. So in a way, a very much uh, hard work ethics and also almost like an entrepreneurship mindset the way you describe it actually, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty yeah, much. I, I, didn't even, I didn't even know the word entrepreneur yeah. <laughs> when I was growing up, but like I think that's what I was surrounded by, a bunch of entrepreneurs. Yeah. So early on, obviously, as a child, at one point, you, you've been saving up little money you could, and you, you bought your first computer, Radio yeah. Shack Color Computer 2, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and I think right. it was a huge deal, a big deal for you personally, uh, because as basic as it was, you were able to create your first programs, I think including one for the fantasy game Dungeons & Dragons, yep. uh, which caught your, the attention, I think, of your teachers. And then, and then the rest, I would say, is almost history. So I, I love to go back to that because when I listen to some of your, again, life stories, you talked about the fact that actually as an undergrad, you studied English, English and you kept it as your minor in, for college and computer science as your major. You actually almost went, I think people don't know that, for an English PhD. So what happened? What, what made you decide between mastering programming versus mastering your native language, English? <laughs> yeah, I don't I mean, so part of it's pragmatic, right? Like I I was uh I was constantly trying to figure out how I was going to support myself and support my family because mm-hmm. I, you know, I got a scholarship that partially covered the cost of going to school but didn't completely, mm-hmm. so I had mm-hmm. student loans. I, you know, I was on on my own from financially you know, and you know, Be- part of that was my decision and part of it was uh, yeah. you know like uh, my parents financial circumstances like I just had to take care of myself yeah, of uh, and yeah. eventually like I had to take care of my entire family yeah. and so part of it was a pragmatic thing like I enjoyed both equally yeah. and so yeah. uh, and and I think that's a tremendous luxury because sometimes sometimes it's hard to even find the one thing that you really enjoy and so I picked computer science and Mm. the story that i told myself about picking computer science is like there's a way to do computer science that is artful that is uh yeah grounded in the humanities and that i wasn't really forsaking anything by making this choice and you know truth truth be told like i'm interested in a lot of things my uh, drive my wife nuts sometimes (laughs) with the uh the amount of stuff that i'm interested in uh and so I, I think it's fine having a vocation that you you know you go focus on and try to make yourself yeah. as good at as you possibly can, and also like it, it's great for you the person and, and like maybe even for the vocation yeah. to like have these other yeah. things that you're interested in as well. Yeah, I think it'd be great. We'll discuss that later, Kevin. As we as we as I ask you to reflect, of course, on AI in in a few questions, a couple of questions, to think about the way in a way those kind of, uh, you know, historical roots between English as a language and technology and AI are kind of coming together you now with the so-called LLMs and more <laughs> and other languages models. So more to come because uh, I think it'd be great to understand actually back in your mind, in your brain, what 
prepare you in a way for that new era. So I think you yeah. wrote your first line of code back in 93. Interesting enough, it was the year, Kevin, I, I joined a, a French software startup company. I was doing modest because I was not good at that. Some basic programming on an Apple II. So it was not nice. a writer's shock. <laughs> nice. That was more, more than 40 years ago. So today, you now shifting really to, the, to today, actually, what would be your advice to a young 18 years old Kevin? who love to learn how to develop a piece of software without being able to go through a computer science degree, uh, which studies, if any, should he consider? How would you go about that today? Yeah, I think... So it sort of depends on what stage of your, uh, you know, your career and your life that you're in. Yeah. So I, I don't know whether I would... I personally would have done anything different because I, uh -huh. I like to understand things as deeply as humanly possible. And, uh, like I, <laughs> and I've, I've always been fascinated with tools. So, uh, yep. like young Kevin would have looked at these, uh, AI systems and would have wanted to understand what's behind the scenes yes. of them and how they yep. worked. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the advice that I would give people more generally is like find whatever it is uh, that you really, really, really have a passion about uh, that is valuable to other people and try to use these mm. tools that you now have available to you to go do that thing. And, you know, like I have a 13-year-old uh -huh. and a 15-year-old who uh, are like thinking about what it is that they want to be. And, yep. you know, my 15-year-old daughter has – wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon for the past few, like it's sort of a weird uh, you oh, know, thing that she got fixated on when she was <laughs> yeah. really young uh, because she watched too much Grey's Anatomy and she, uh, you know, like had a yeah. couple of doctor yeah. uh, uh, parents that were, uh, hmm. uh, you know, pa parents of her friends yep. in school. And she, you know, had decided that She's not a tech person, uh, hmm. but her mind has been changed over the past few years. Like the hmm. way that she's using tools like ChatGPT yep. and GitHub Copilot to help her solve these medical problems and healthcare <laughs> problems that she's really motivated by is like quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and so, like, I think that's the that's the mindset. It's like True. all of these problems we need to go solve, like all of these things that matter and that are important. And we have increasingly powerful tools yeah. Yeah. to go do them. And like you, you don't have to be a programmer anymore to get yeah. the computer to do unbelievably powerful things for you in service of what it is you're trying to accomplish. No, I think it's a great story, and it reminds me of a, of one of the episodes I had with uh, Sal Khan, and the way, of course, he's been developing the Camingo <laughs> uh, yep. AI agent, who is becoming increasingly, and when you ask him the question about the future, kind of your personal tutor beyond actually just the course yep. you are taking on, and you know, he could even portray a day where uh, you would say, well, you know. It could become actually a lifelong learning agent for all of us. And so we, we could yeah. actually, all of us keep learning a bunch of things differently. Yeah. And like, <laughs> I think we, we all learn differently um, and we all learn at different rates. I mean, I, I was reflecting on this actually this morning. So I'm, uh, I'm learning, um, I'm learning how to. Uh, do ceramics uh, right now. Oh, and so wow. like the way that I learn is like, I can go, uh, watch a bunch of videos and read a bunch of books and yep. like I can absorb it all but like I, when it comes to the practice of the thing that I'm trying to learn and like so I have to actually go do it because do it, I don't know how on. to prioritize all of this information <laughs> yes. I've stuffed in my head and like that's a like I, I think the way that I learn is like hmm. a, a, other people do it but it, it, it yep. is idiosyncratic like there, yep. there are <laughs> other ways that people learn yeah. that are more effective for them than how I learn and so like this idea that you could have an infinitely patient uh, tutor that could adapt to your particular learning needs like yes. very individually like yeah. I, I think is it's just a really <laughs> interesting powerful idea I think it's a wonderful analogy again just uh, another very recent podcast visit I had with a, a French chief right uh, in terms of cooking called Thierry Marx <laughs> who is uh, at least well known in country and beyond he's doing some amazing work as well socially and, you know, he, he, he's someone who loves about talking about this philosophy of 
basically learning by doing, putting his hands yeah. in, into the what he called the katas of cooking, <laughs> the fundamentals yeah. of cooking. And this is where he grew up as a kid, actually, in the kitchens of big chiefs anyway. So a very nice analogy, which I love when it comes to AI. Let's go back to the roots of AI with Alan Turing, a pioneering figure in computer science and, and AI. In a seminal 1950 paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, he asked the following questions. Can machines think? Can machines do what we as thinking entities can do? And he said, it is possible to do a machine which will learn by experience. And obviously, we know that his work laid the foundational concept that continue to guide AI research and development today. So a lot has happened since Alan Turing, obviously, <laughs> Kevin, and even his first test over the past 70 years, can't believe it. What did you personally experience as the most stunning breakthrough, uh, you know, over the past many years? And what has been the most defining moment, in a way, if I can ask the question, in your own tech life, when you realize that we are really entering in a, in a very different new era? Yeah. Well, yeah, may, maybe I could just pull back for a second and talk about the history of AI. Like we yeah. we have we've had an extraordinary difficult time across the entire history of the discipline of AI. So when Turing wrote that paper, hmm. the the term artificial intelligence hadn't been coined yet. It was uh, yeah. five years later at a workshop at Dartmouth yeah. uh, mm -hmm. when. Uh, a, a bunch of these mathematicians and computer scientists and information theorists sat down and, and <laughs> said, hey, we want to build a machine that in many ways can replicate what a human brain human does. Being. And like we're yeah. going to call this study, this new field, artificial intelligence. Hmm. And we have had a really hard time over the entire history of the discipline, even defining what artificial intelligence is. And like we've hmm. got this track record of we go yeah. – we we think that we understand what in intelligence is, like what our own intelligence is, and then we go build uh, machines to replicate some aspect of it. And as soon as we accomplish the thing, then we yep. redefine what the you know the measure of intelligence is. Like we used to think that that you know the apotheosis of mm -hmm. of <clears throat> human cognition are these very challenging games like chess and go. Yeah, and in yeah. 1997, IBM built a system called. Uh, Deep Blue, Deep Blue that right. beat Gary Kasparov, who was the world champion chess player at the time at chess. And it was stunning. Like, nobody thought it was possible. Uh, and as soon as it happened, uh, like, we we figured out that, like, oh, this really isn't the the breakthrough mm. that is going to, you know, tip us over yeah. into, you know, this idea of artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like, this solves a very narrow thing, mm. and, and and like you know, funny enough, like I think chess is now like a more popular human yeah, pastime and hobby, and like you you could even think about it as a sport, uh, right. you know, given uh, yeah. how competitive it is and how much uh, joy people derive from like competing and watching the competition. Yeah. Um, even though since 1997, there has never been a human chess player as good as a computer at playing <laughs> chess. Like, we just don't care anymore. Yeah. Um, but we keep and playing. And so, we you know, I, I think that's yes. a really important thing to keep in mind. And, and you know, to, to answer your exact question, like, the yeah. most stunning, you yeah. know, breakthrough, I think, in my um, in my career probably, uh, like, happened recently. Uh, really? It, it was when... <laughs> Uh, when GPT-4 finished training uh, and hmm. this idea that we had that you could follow a particular path of developing artificial intelligence was going to yeah. uh, result in an AI system that was very generally useful hmm. for doing a bunch of cognitive tasks. Uh, that was a big uh, moment. Like I, I, <laughs> I, I, I had a strong sense that it was coming, but I didn't know it was coming this hmm. fast. And and the thing doesn't think. So mm. like you know what mm. you're going back to your Turing quote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, he said two distinct things. Uh, like one is he's talking about thinking, and one he's talking about you know can we write a piece of software that emulates yeah. uh, you know aspects Human. of what our brains do? And so absolutely we can do the latter, but the former is like this, is. like almost a philosophical thing. Like I it don't is. even. 
yeah, when when I say like, hey, you know, JP, you know, mm-hmm. do you think like, what are you thinking about? Like, how do yeah, you think? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like that's a very human question. Huge uh, human questions. Yeah. And, and like, they, it's very different <laughs> from what these software systems are doing. For sure. So b- back just a couple of years ago, can you just allude to that? You were really an inception point of the partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI. And because back in the spring of 2018, I think when you first went down to meet them, uh, obviously OpenAI already had a relationship with Microsoft uh, using Azure. And you met the team, including Sam Maltman and also Ilya Sitzkever. What were your first impressions meeting those guys and, and, the world, and the work they were doing at the time before ChatGPT 4, 4.5 Turbo and more coming up now? <laughs> Well, I, I will tell you, I was skeptical going into the meeting, and mm. and like my my skepticism in general is uh, like just uh, personality disorder, like not uh, <laughs> anything specific to the team. Like I'm always yeah. slightly skeptical of uh, things that I haven't fully understand, and sometimes like I will go fully understand them, and I'm still skeptical afterwards. <laughs> but this was one of those rare instances where I went in, and I was yeah, I, I've been building machine learning systems at that point since 2004. Uh, so, and, you know, like very large scale things, uh, you know, doing very valuable uh, commercial applications of machine learning. And I was not prepared to go into that meeting to have my mindset about what was possible Hmm. in the next handful of years change. And I walked out of it, like, absolutely convinced that, uh, like, we were on the cusp of something very interesting. Like we were still years away, but like, yeah. you know, they, they, they had a framework and a way of thinking about uh, the problem that they were tackling mm-hmm. that uh, was very scientific. Uh, you know, there was, there was a methodology, like, you know, here's the experiment we're gonna run, this is what we will learn from it, uh, and like, this is what it will tell us about the experiment we will go run after that. And, you know, I, I thought we had the foundations mm-hmm. uh, for, a partnership where you know, we could do some valuable things for them uh, yep. to support like this very disciplined development of a very useful AI system. And like the, the way that it was going to be useful and interesting for us was that it wasn't trying to solve a narrow problem. Mm. So a lot of the AI systems before then like were built uh, to solve a narrow problem like play chess, uh, play go, um, Mm -hmm. predict which ad someone is going to click on. Um, and, but this was a, yeah, we're, we're, we think we're going to be able to build this system and that as a function of scale, it's going to become more broadly useful and you're going to be able to build like dozens and hundreds and thousands and, you know, millions of applications on top of it. Um, and like as a platform company, like that, that's a, that's exactly the mission Microsoft has been on for you know um, almost five decades now. For sure, no, uh, great, great. Uh, I would say clarity about that trigger uh, in the history of AI, Kevin, and what you experienced yourself. I'd like to come back to your book and the role you have at Microsoft because I think you've been always what well, I got to know you quite skeptical, yes, but actually quite optimist as well. Someone's driving the positive side of innovation, I would say. That's, my, that's also my bias, I must admit, as you know. And so, but you also experienced uh, early on in your childhood, as you said, poverty and loss of industry in the region where you grew up. Yep. And so you understand well the need to invest in rural infrastructure. So let's imagine that uh, today, Kevin, you are now in charge of shaping the social and economic development of Virginia that you know so well. What should you, what should you do, right? to transform the lives of the people in those rural communities, to reshape the traditional sectors like construction, textile, furniture, agriculture, and more. In other words, how would you reprogram the American dream in your home city? What would you do if you are in charge <laughs> with AI? Yeah, I think the thing that you should do, and this is, this is a set of things that we ought to be thinking about doing fairly broadly, actually, uh, not just in the rural parts of the United States, but in the developing world and, you know, yeah, and, uh, yeah and, and like, honestly, in all parts of the industrialized world as well. So 
I, I think job one is you actually have to have the infrastructure in place to support people using AI tools to solve the problems that they want to solve. So right. part of it is like, do you have a platform available? Is it open? Like, is it getting cheaper yeah. and more powerful over time? Uh, like, is it, uh, you know, can you operate it freely uh, across uh, you know, global boundaries? Uh, um you know, it means some very basic things. Like one of the struggles that uh, folks in my community have is the mm. uh, you know, internet just doesn't work well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my yeah. my mom and brother live near a local mm. uh, uh, telephone building, like the the exchange for Gladys, uh, yeah. and they have very good internet. And mm. my uncle, who lives three away. miles away, <laughs> uh, has. 300 kilobit per second internet, wow. which was great in 1990 <laughs> yeah. uh, and is pretty horrendous yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and so, so if, you know, you, you can't leverage AI if you can't if you connect don't to AI. Structure. Yes. Um, and then, like, I think a bunch of the stuff you need to go do is, like, yeah. really educate people uh, uh, to be <laughs> entrepreneurs in a sense. Yeah. So yeah. how do you how do you take young people and expose them to like this full palette of tools that they have to use uh, yep. and like help them think critically about what the interesting problems mm. there are in the world that they could put those tools to use solving. Um, and it's like, a, it's a very different educational paradigm than the one that we've had since the beginning of the industrial revolution where sure. it was like, you know, you, you, you human being like need to, you know, learn these hmm. basic skills. You need to be literate. You need to know yeah. a little bit of math. Yeah. You need to have structure in your life where you can get up in the morning and like go do something for hmm. this number of hours and, <laughs> you know, work in teams and understand hierarchies and like all of this stuff. Like that was very industrial oh, yeah. revolution sort of learning. Completely. And that's not really it, what we need right now. Anymore. Uh, not anymore. No. <laughs> so it's both infrastructure, it's skilling, it's actually lowering the bar of accessing as well, not just freely, but also I think the level of confidence, right? To, yeah. Because there's a lot of fear in many countries I travel the world as well for a company. And I can still see a lot of confusion, fear, anxiety in just getting access to AI. And, and so I think there's a lot to be done there as well, in terms of education. Yeah. Uh, well, so, sorry, good. Yeah, going. and, and, and yes. you know, not, not, not to interrupt, but like, I, yeah. I think if you, part of my job is, and like I, I do this even if it weren't my job is, uh, you know, sort of thinking about long time horizons. Yes. And so it's really hard for us to think past, you know, the the month, the quarter, the year, you know, the next election yep. cycle, like whatever it is, like we're very short time horizon focus. But if you look over, you know, decade time Decades. horizons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've got some very challenging things happening in the world. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You have a warming climate, which is going to impose a whole bunch of uh, structural changes on the world. Like we, we basically have designed a world for one temperature regime and we're yeah. about to enter another it's one. And like we yeah. have lots of work to go do to adapt to that and to like try to you know engineer an Redesign. energy economy that yeah. won't make the yeah you know, the temperature regime worse than it's going to be yeah. um but you know maybe the one that we don't talk a lot about is demographic change so uh, you know almost everywhere in the industrialized world we are either in population decline or the population growth is decelerating and you can sort of see a point near in the future oh, where yeah. you're going to Plateauing tip into and... deceleration i mean yeah. it's actually funny like i think the united states and france are uh, demographically are two of the countries that are in the best situation. Like I think uh, the last data I looked at, France will uh, like but, decelerating, but still you know growing right. uh, but, through the 2030s. Uh, I think, but it's but actually getting to almost to decline. Oh, Kevin, just last year we had this pretty bad signal in France. Yeah, still ahead of most European countries, but just like in the US, I think we are. The most the but, last one last yeah <laughs> yeah but 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 italy's in decline germany's yes. in decline yeah. china's in, in decline japan japan is in japan and Big, italy huge, in particular in pretty serious decline, decline. Russia. and so like if you think about like in our lifetime like this isn't yeah. you know yeah. like an imaginary time horizon where i'm worrying on the behalf of you know my children which i which i do but like we can also worry on behalf of ourselves 
Yeah. Um, these demographic changes in the world will mean that you just don't have a big enough workforce to go do the work of the world unless you have major breakthroughs in productivity. <laughs> And major breakthroughs in technology in, in productivity mean technology. And so whether it's AI yeah. or something else, like something has to happen or you know, sure. we will have a profoundly different world than the one that we occupy right now. And like AI is currently the, the best, best shot shots. on goal for right. productivity that we have. Yeah, no, I fully agree with you. It's fascinating to see all that happening. Hopefully in our lives, as you say, Kevin. So I'd like to shift gears a bit, and you actually alluded to uh, the times we are going through right now in 24. This is actually the biggest election year in history, as you know, with countries representing more than half of the world's population, like 4 billion people are going to send their citizens to the polls. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was re reading a book I got from uh, Bill Gates, of course, our founder and first CEO of the company. Uh, he, he wrote this book in 1985 uh, called The Road Ahead. He said... We don't have option of turning away from the future. No one gets to vote on whether technology is going to change our lives. So Kevin, do you agree that no one gets to vote for using AI in their lives? Oh, they totally get to vote. Okay. Uh, so, the, so like, the, the, in, you know, I, I, uh, I agree with Bill on a great many things, <laughs> sure. uh, like on this particular point. Uh, like yeah. I, I, I agree. And, you know, the thing that I will say is if you the, – the problem I think that you have in democratic society is if you make the choices very brittle that people have to make, then the votes can be right. really, you know, stark. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the, the way – the way that I talk about this and I wrote about it in the book and like I talk about it all the time and like it's one of the things that I love about Satya so much is like I, I think all the time about permission. Yes. So we, we get to do what we do because society has given us permission. We don't have a right to do what we do. We, 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 don't. Uh, <laughs> we currently have permission to do what we do and like yes. the permission can be revoked if we do it irresponsibly yes. uh, if we are not listening very carefully to what people are telling us and like that is you, you know if you have that mindset like you, you you basically have more fluid voting because before you have to have like extreme votes like people are voting every day by telling you what they do and don't like and if you're listening yeah. and adapting yes. what you're doing uh, you know hopefully you get into an equilibrium yeah. that uh, people are happy with that they feel confident about and hopeful about um, but you you can't just jam stuff uh, no. into society like that it it really doesn't in the limit work that way yeah I fully agree with you Kevin again in my roles over the many years myself I've been traveling many governments countries around the world so many times that uh, I was really interested to listen to the the last the state of the nation pitch by your president Joe Biden he said we must address the growing concern about AI-generated voice impersonations. I propose a ban on the misuse of this technology to create deceptive voice recordings or responsibilities to manage the risk associated with AI, especially in areas like society, economy, and national security. So how should governments in the first place, and as we just starting to talk about that, tech companies like Microsoft and their peers embrace what we've called responsible AI? What does it mean, yeah. actually, if you could share your thinking practical in a practical way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, since responsible AI is sort of like responsible governance or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, generally accepted accounting practices or what, like we, right. we have, it, it is about saying this is what we believe responsible AI means. It is being transparent, uh, like in the saying. So like publish yep. what your guidelines are uh, yep. and then having a set of processes and controls inside of your company that make sure that you adhere to the standard and then being willing to engage with stakeholders uh, about Regulators. evolving the standard and like having some degree of uh, auditability of your processes for adhering to it. And so... You know, I, I think every company that is developing and deploying this technology 
needs a framework like this um yep. the same way that you know you've got board audit committees and like mm. you have uh outside well, auditors that are looking at your books uh so yep. like it yeah, when a thing gets important enough, like you, you need some kind of framework uh, so that collectively everybody can believe that you're doing the thing right. Um, and so, you know, some of the stuff that I think the president called for mm. is like perfectly reasonable. Like one of the things that we've been very, very hesitant about, and like we've had, uh, we've had technology that can do interesting things with. Uh, with voices for a while, and like for, for a while, we have chosen not to deploy that because the yep. the risk of people using that in fraudulent ways in ways that far outweigh the benefits seems you know like something we need to think carefully about. And maybe at some point you will do it because yep. yeah, the, there there are also positive uses for the technology. Like one of the things that we uh, mm-hmm. we've been doing in my team is uh, there's this. Uh, neurodegenerative disease called ALS uh, Hmm. that will ultimately cause, among other things, people to literally lose their voice. And so we have been using this technology to archive people's voices. So (laughs) before they lose the ability to speak, we get enough of a set of samples from their actual speech so that you could have an AI system give them their voice back. And so like that is an unbelievably (laughs) powerful and beneficial thing. And so... Yeah. <laughs> With all of this stuff, it's about the balances. It's like, what good yes. does it enable? Like, what bad does it enable? And like, how do you make sure that the good far outweighs the bad? And that like, when the bad is really bad, that you can, uh, you know, prevent that from happening and and you know, yeah, you know, very 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 quickly detect and mitigate misuse. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. And I think uh, obviously not just as a company, but with the industry and others. I think I've never seen my 40 years plus in tech. Uh, I mean, as much as I would say urgency coming from government themselves, actually, to regulate. It's happening in Europe, it's happening in the US, it's happening in Asia. And I think we are all in around the table to make sure we agree on those guiding principles and then implement some tools and processes. And you know that well, Kevin, because you're also the head of a responsible AI office with some of your peers at Microsoft to make sure that in our, in our own ways of building AI tools, we do it as in a much responsible way. And I think that's, maybe you don't know if yeah. you want to touch a bit on that, on the way our customers can benefit from those practices as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're a platform company and so wherever possible when we're building uh, tools and infrastructure to help ourselves uh, build products and to launch them and operate them you know, safely and efficiently and you know, all the other attributes you want of products, like we try to make that infrastructure available to customers. And so, yeah, yeah we we have a, uh, we're on the second version of our uh, responsible AI standard that we have published, uh, yeah. which uh, like the new uh, US uh, NIST AI uh, mm. framework that they have published is, uh, uh, based in part on our responsible AI hmm. framework. Uh, and uh, there are a bunch of, uh, companies and partners who are using our RAI framework as a jumping off point for their own. Yep. Uh, and like we have an increasingly sophisticated set of infrastructure that we're offering in Azure to help people build uh, and operate AI powered products responsibly. And so it's, you know, it's a brand new tool yep. chain. Like it's a way of testing things, it's a way of monitoring things. It's, uh, um, yeah, it, it, yeah. Like, it, it, and increasingly the tools that you use for RAI are powered by AI themselves, uh, which yeah. is like one of the really interesting things. The more powerful AI gets, uh, the more powerful your RAI infrastructure gets. Gets. Um, yeah, the, the one one thing that I will say, yep. like since we're talking about policy and regulation, mm-hmm. is that there is also like you know the same way that when you're developing a technology, there's this balance between you know uh, benefits and harms that you're yep. trying to weigh. Balance. There there's also uh, like positive and negative for regulation. So mm-hmm. like if you regulate too aggressively and too early, like you may curtail the development of technology that can be yes. unbelievably beneficial. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the the thing that I I think again, this is all about uh, societal equilibrium here. Like, yep. we 
we we have to do what we're doing in a way where we have enough societal trust where we can develop the technology and let people lay their hands on it and evaluate whether it's good mm. or bad themselves so that we can inform the regulation that actually has to happen. Yeah. Um, if you don't do that, like you're kind of regulating into a vacuum, you're sort of imagining what a future, you know, might be and like you don't you even don't. know that it exists. And um, you, you sort of risk two things like, you know, regulating the wrong thing. So like you think very thoughtfully about regulation, you pass yep. something and it doesn't, doesn't produce mess. the effect you intended uh, yeah. or, you know, like you inhibit something that mm. you know, could be very, very valuable. Yeah. No, I think it was it was really great you could share that. I, I, I would say as usual with any innovation, but really with this one in particular, it's really a balancing act between policies at the highest level, but also then technology innovation, processes, and people, people, people. We don't dig into that, but obviously people are critical yeah. <laughs> to the way you, well, like, you do it, and it, develop. It, yeah, yeah pe people, people, people is the right thing. Like, yeah. uh, honestly, like that's the most important thing. So yeah. it's more important than the regulation. It's more yeah. important than like, you know, the implementation details. It's like if you are not doing something that is – valuable that is serving the public interest that is should, like making uh like everyone's lives net better then you know what are you doing like you're yeah. you're just yeah you're honestly wasting your time like you don't need regulation you need to wake up and stop doing what you're doing <laughs> okay that's a foundational principle no i like to shift gears a little bit and and and, and use one of the favorite one of the favorite cuts he has many of our manager command manager satya a poem, you know, Satya likes poems, Kevin, as you know. It is one cut from uh, this Austrian poet called Rainer Maria Rilke. He once wrote that the future enters into us in order to transform itself in us long before it happens. So, Kevin, is AI entering into us? <laughs> is AI entering into humans for a better world or for a dystopian world? Well, I think te technology in a sense, I mean, there, there are many people who will disagree with me, but like I do think that technology is um, it, it's it's almost neutral. Um, mm -hmm. And so obviously when a technology emerges, uh, it, it absolutely changes us. Uh, it changes uh, and like changes us, I think, in pretty deep ways. Uh, like if you you just imagine uh you and i for instance um mm -hmm. like how we process the world and see the world is deeply influenced by like a whole bunch of technologies that have emerged over the past 40 years like yeah. i i had a um my great grandmother who passed mm -hmm. away many years ago lived to be 100 years old and like she was mm -hmm. born in the 19th century yeah. uh <laughs> and like lived through uh like the the first stages of the like the first internet bubble and yeah. so like she went from a world that had no electricity <laughs> no cars no airplanes uh like you know she, she didn't have indoor plumbing she you know like no she, fridge, she, she was in you know this sort of <laughs> yeah barely industrialized uh yeah. you know kind of victorian world when she was <laughs> born uh and by the end you know like we had airplanes space travel satellites yeah. internet uh mobile phones <laughs> uh and and so like technology has an extraordinary impact on yeah the lives not just how we live our lives but yeah. like how we sort of perceive reality um and and whether that's good or bad is up to us. Yeah. So it's it's choices that we make about how we use the technology, like what we decide to put it to. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, if you look over the long arc of history, like there's mm -hmm. this. Uh, it, it has been by and large positive. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, it. it and in, in a sense, like it has to be, otherwise you have no progress over very long periods of time. Uh, yeah, like if you choose yeah. the wrong path every time, like you will collapse. Uh, and so, yeah, we occasionally choose wrong things and then we course correct. And mm -hmm. like, you know, we've been building, building, building to, <laughs> you know, a world that is so much more prosperous uh, than the world that you or I were born into uh, uh, or the world that. You know, certainly that my great grandmother was born into yeah. where, you know, there's 
you know, less violence, less disease, uh, you know, like there's, and there's all of these things, like there's disease yeah. and suffering and, and like all, all of the things still exist. It's just, they're much less now than they were, um, decades ago. Yeah, decades and, ago. Uh. you know, the question we have to ask ourselves is people who build technology is, are we doing the best job that we possibly mm. can to build technology in a way where, you know, 40 years from now, mm. our children and our grandchildren will look back and say, wow, this was beneficial. Uh, right. Like this, this matter, this made all of these things yeah. that we care yeah. about with justice and the human condition better, not worse. And like, we better get it right. We better get it right. Absolutely. That's a big, that's a big question. That's uh, there's not even any financing amount associated with this question, I think, Kevin. I, I love us to pursue, because we're almost coming to an end, Kevin, with more positive scenarios in mind. You mentioned already a couple of great examples like ALS. You know, I could refer as well to EyeSight. I could refer to a wonderful, had a wonderful visit in India two, three weeks ago. And, you know, this is a wonderful multilingual platform they built, and Microsoft Research yeah. actually has been, has been partnering with them to enable one of the actually they have 270 languages 22 officials <laughs> enabling a farmer in a remote village to talk his language to be not just translated to english and hindi but to connect and using a copilot like chat gpt interface to get access for the first time ever to the public subsidies he, he, he was actually able to get in his life and it can apply to farming education what are what are you the most excited about in regards to application of gen ai when it comes to the most positive breakthrough for the society. Yeah, I think there's so much stuff. That that one that you mentioned in particular, the pattern, I think, is really interesting. So one of the things that modern generative AI ought to be very good at is helping everyone navigate the complexity of the world. Yeah. So, you know, the, the example that you gave is a good one. Uh, like we've been doing some work with an organization in the United States called Share Our Strength, which mm. uh, whose mission is to feed kids. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's just sort of amazing, like how much childhood hunger there is and like what the knock on effects of uh, childhood mm. hunger are like a tremendous amount of yeah. what gets diagnosed as ADHD is actually mm. just kids being hungry. And like when you're hungry, you can't focus, sure. you can't learn and like, you know, just sort of yeah. becomes a snowball effect in people's Sorry, lives. Bro. And so the thing that we're doing with Share Our Strength is like we're trying to figure out how to use generative AI to help people navigate the uh, entitlement programs that already exist, that already are funded, uh, the, 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 the money has been appropriated and it's sitting there unspent because people yeah. either aren't aware of it or can't navigate the, the bureaucracy to sign yeah. themselves up for it. And yeah. this ought to be – a great thing for generative AI to help with. And like we're yes. working and, and like, I think that that is a pattern is hmm. really, really extraordinarily powerful. I, I think educational equity is another thing. The like I, I look at, okay. yeah, my, my daughter goes to a, um, mm -hmm. like a very good school here in yep. Silicon Valley, uh, with excellent teachers. It's, hmm. uh, yeah, my, my, you know, my, my school did, you know, the best that, uh, it could do back in the 70s and 80s, uh, rural central Virginia. But like, yeah. if I look at my school versus my daughter's school, like, it, wow. not not even a comparison. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the the thing that I think AI could do is like close that gap to hmm. try to make a higher quality of uh, education and learning and enablement more equally available, uh, not yeah. just across the United States, but across the Real, world. The world. Um, you know, and then like I think there's some truly exciting stuff happening right yeah. now where the the fundamental pattern driving mm -hmm. progress in AI right now, this notion of self supervised learning, uh, yeah. that you can mm -hmm. transform compute and data and increasingly just compute hmm. into AI systems that can solve very complicated problems, uh, is applicable to more than just language. Yeah. And so we we're doing some really fascinating work at Microsoft Research on how you can apply these techniques to physics and chemistry and biology yes. to help with, you know, building the next 
electrolyte for energy mm-hmm. storage or uh, you know designing a therapeutic molecule that will yeah. cure a disease uh, and and you know I, it's the the thing I, I think is underappreciated because mm-hmm. they're more complicated for a lay person to right uh, yeah. You know, perceive what the perceive, progress perceive. is uh, versus you know what's happening with language agents or you know linguistic base agents yeah. uh is like the progress is extraordinary so yeah. like these are not little steps we're making no. like they are just unbelievable so in some cases like the biggest you know jumps forward in progress that we've ever seen um and so it's yeah. just a, it's an exciting it's... exciting exciting <laughs> time no, I share the excitement with you. Of course, I'm lucky enough being part of Microsoft to see some amazing, mind-blowing developments going on. Finishing last couple of questions, Kevin, with even more positive stories because that's the the core, the spirit of my podcast, as you know. I know that with your wife, Shannon Hunt Scott, you started the Scott Foundation back in 2014 with a desire to give back to the Silicon Valley community where they work and raise their family. I think the initial focus of the foundation was on supporting leading-edge organizations addressing critical needs such as childhood hunger, early childhood education, women, girls in technology. So, so what is it that you and your wife are the most proud of? <laughs> and, and do you see yourself more and more involved in such foundations like our friend Bill has done for the last few decades of his life now? <laughs> Yeah, I I I I think what Bill has done with the Gates Foundation is really extraordinary. Um and yeah, the 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 thing I think that makes their accomplishment extraordinary is like they've just picked a handful of things to focus on and like they yeah. they have just Super. driven very intensely to try to solve I mean like the the work that they've done in public health is uh just extraordinary and like, and like they they have chosen like mm-hmm. here are these acute problems that are not getting solved fast enough uh that don't yeah. have a natural mechanism to get solved so like if something doesn't change like they're going to be uh like Millions just as bad yeah. or worse you know yeah. 50 years from now um and so the the thing that we focus on at the scott foundation is trying to identify and relieve structural uh Mm. structural poverty cycles so things that lock people into intergenerational poverty um yeah yeah and the reason that that's our focus is because both my wife and i grew up uh you know not uh not terribly privileged i mean we had some privilege uh you know because you know you know even though you know my dad went bankrupt a couple of times and, you know, like we had, uh, you know, we had a lot of, you know, financial hardship to go deal with, uh, you know, like we still, you know, were more privileged than mm. someone who was, you know, born, yeah. you know, in equatorial Africa, for instance, in the 1970s. Uh, yeah. yeah. So like, I, I think you always have to appreciate, you know, what you have, but yeah, we, we, I think both my wife and I, in a sense, look at ourselves and we're like, wow, like there there are a handful of things that happened to us uh, mm. that if they hadn't have happened, like we would have had very, very, different very life. different lives. Different lives, um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, the, the point of the foundation is like, what can you do to go engineer a helping hand, to go engineer mm. some of the good luck that my wife and I had so and. that, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have to have so much left to chance and getting people to like snap yes. out of a poverty cycle. Um, and, and we try to invest in mm-hmm. organizations that are entrepreneurial. So mm. who, you know, where you, they're, they're thinking about how you can take an investment and, and with leverage, uh, you know, with tools like AI, for instance, uh, like you can go tackle yeah. a problem and like get a big, a big benefit. Impact. A big impact. Yeah. That's wonderful. My very last questions, two, if I may, one very quickly, in the positive leadership philosophy, you know, we, we learn how to be self-aware and how to build our self-confidence, but also to build our own positivity, which I think is super important, by the way, in the way we show up, in the way we connect with people. So what are, what are your daily routines, Kevin, or, or maybe habits you have from time to time to grow your positive leadership <laughs> with your colleagues, customers, and all the people you, you connect with in your lives? 
Yeah, so th- there, there's a bunch of stuff actually, um, yep. and since we don't have a lot of time, like yep. maybe, maybe I'll just sort of say the most yep. important one. I, I think it is really important for your own positivity and the positivity that you project in the world to be grateful. Yes, like to to just no, no matter how crappy your day is, uh, to ground yourself in like what's one thing. That, that I been... can be grateful for today. <laughs> yes, yes. And and the reason I think it's so important is because mm. once you start feeling gratitude, yeah. uh, th- there's almost a snowball effect to it. You can, uh, you can... Like once you've felt the first thing you're grateful for, it's easy to see all of the other things that you should be grateful for. And Absolutely. it helps you be <laughs> humbler. Uh, it, it, it uh, like I, I, I think it's one of the, the, yeah. it's one of the, you know, foundations of having compassion in your yep. life, of being yep. able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, and, shoes and like not feeling what they're feeling, but yes. to, you know, just try to understand what their point of view is and like why they, uh, you know, why they, yep. why they might be, you know, doing what they're doing. Uh, like even if, you know, your knee jerk reaction is like, eh, yes. you know, this is irritating. <laughs> uh, like there's always a reason for yep. everything. Uh, so, like, just yeah. a little bit of gratitude can go an gratitude. awfully long way. Yeah, and then caring for the people. My very last question, I promise you, Kevin, because, uh, I mean, you are still a young man, at least relative to me. Everything is relative in life, <laughs> I think. And, and so it's a bit early to, to be thinking about your legacy, but perhaps what story would you like people to tell, to tell about you, about you, Kevin, in the future? Um, what is it? Kind of the mark you want to leave and... The impression you want to 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 leave behind yourself. I I don't know. Um, <laughs> like honestly, I I I'm deeply uncomfortable with anybody paying any attention at all to what I'm doing. Like what what I would like, yeah. Um, is I I would like the opportunity to work with people who care about what it is that they're doing uh yeah. and like the thing often that i'm you know proudest about i just got a note this morning from uh you know a friend uh like a, a someone that i hired uh hmm. like many many like 19 years ago actually hmm. uh and like they sent me a note on the 19th anniversary of uh their start date at like you hmm. know this thing yeah. that we were both doing back then and like thanked me um hmm. And, you know, like I should be thanking them because Hmm. the thing that makes me feel the best about what I've done is uh, like having some tiny little impact, a positive impact on someone's career. Yeah. Uh, And just seeing the things that those people go do uh, after we are no longer working closely together just fills me with joy. Yes. Um, Yes. and, And so just knowing that uh you know like i i i, I kind of don't care what everybody uh thinks of me but like having those people that i've yes. like worked with like feel like you know hey it wasn't yeah. a waste of time working with kevin scott uh like i i like that that's what i would like and like obviously like i yeah. <laughs> care a lot about what my family uh of course thinks like i i want to yeah. Yeah, I want to support them and their ambitions and dreams and you know like have my wife yes. be successful and my children be successful yes. and uh you know do good things in the world and and believe that you know they had a husband and a father who yeah. supported <laughs> them being their best selves. Yeah. That's a wonderful way to to close the podcast Kevin. It's been wonderful to feel your gratitude, to feel your joy as well, <laughs> to feel the vibes of AI innovation opening to wonderful things in the world while being very conscious about our sensibility for sure. So thank you so much, Kevin. I enjoy tremendously, of course, our partnership in the company, but also as, as a friend in this podcast. It's been incredible. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much for having me on and thanks for, uh, thanks for putting positive energy out into the world. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Thank you.